Thanks everyone for coming uh, to the first of hopefully monthly uh, faculty networking events hosted by the CBB and co-hosted by the Games Institute. And I'd like to start off by thanking Games for hosting this one. Uh, our theme for today is uh, virtual reality and augmented reality in research. And um, also everyone for attending because uh, I'm really happy to see the turnout. So the questions we'll be answering today based off of what our speakers are doing will be how you're using VR and AR in research, uh, what are some roadblocks you encountered, and where your future aspirations see the technology going. Our t the speakers today will be uh, Sylvia Samuel actually sends his regrets. He has some GI issues, but might be here later. So first speaker will be Jen Bogar. Uh, next will be Gaeta Jane and Michael Barnett Cohen. Um, the format will be about 10 to 12 to 13 minutes of speaking with a couple minutes of questions. But the whole idea is to have networking thereafter to come up with ideas. Thank you to our guests, Exo Insights, Stack Zero, and Krishna from the NRC as well. So the goals of these events are to actually bring researchers together from different faculties. So many times I see faculty just work with the people who are right next door to them. And there's times where I've been trying to facilitate bringing people together from multiple faculties, and it's resulted in some lot of, a lot of fun research. So I'm excited that hopefully if these succeed, that we'll start bringing re-faculty together under a given themes so that we can keep track of what's going on and then ideally provide an opportunity to create big teams for big grants like NSERC Create Grants, CIHR Project Grant, the New Frontiers Grants that are going to be coming out. Uh, just a quick reminder, the CIHR Project Grant is due February 6th for the registration of the application March 6th. But we, what we want is from these networking centers to have you connect with us at the very beginning see where you need partnership, collaboration, and the centers are there to support you. And that support <laughs> can look like uh, facilitating introductions with companies, working with you to obtaining company letter supports or cash, helping with contract negotiation, NDA, whenever you want to have initial meetings with companies. Again, learning about your research interests <laughs> and interest in partnering so that we can do outreach. Uh, identify appropriate sources of funding because there's not only just small funds out there. Like AgeWell is a huge, uh, huge focus uh, this month, but there's plenty of other ideas that are coming out that uh, we try to keep on top of. Uh, also, there's a certain problem of project management when you have large-scale teams coming together for big grants. We can help with that through games and CBB, but also project management thereafter. CBB has a part-time coordinator for our NSERC Create grant, so that's what we're, our centers can help too. And then also marketing and communication. So connect with us if you're seeking support, if companies reach out to you, if you're a new faculty member, uh, if you have lab space to advertise, we can help bring people together that way as well. Uh, exploring inter uh, alternative sources of funding, and if you're looking for collaborators. Uh, so. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here, and I'll hand it over to Jen for her presentation. Well, the important person is setting up. I'll, I'll say a few things here. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I now realize that the best way to hold an event on campus is to wait for the worst possible day. <laughs> it works out really, really well. Uh, by the way, if I start hacking and coughing in a few minutes, it's because I've just come off what I honestly believe to be the worst possible cold in the history of the planet. Uh, there's probably no actual proof of this, but I think I'm there. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Christina and Colin for setting this up. This was a, a CBB initiative that we brought, uh, uh, contacted the GI to come to get. But CBB and GI are just things you get used to, the, the, the initials around here. We'll, we'll offer several more, like VR and AR. And sure, in a minute. But uh, Colin, thanks for mentioning the fact that we're, you know, we look for the large research centers. Uh, CBB and, and the Games Institute are... Uh, two of the eight uh, university-level research centers on campus, and we're looking for ways to coordinate activities, to, to combine um, resources, to uh, um, collaborate in various projects, including grant production. So um, we're in the process right now of putting together a SHRC partnership grant. Um, uh, I, I'm doing it with, with a guy that I'm mostly in that office over there. She sits in the corner and makes sure I'm not playing games. And uh, it's working out really well so far, actually. But anyway, we're, we're, if, if you're doing research in VR and you're interested in the narrative side of VR, uh, by all means get in touch with me because there's still room to uh, be part of this grant proposal. 
uh, it's due sooner than anybody wants it to be. So thanks to Christina and Colin. We're interested in the opportunity to work together. The Games Institute is a um, university level research center, very, very interdisciplinary. In fact, the space you're sitting in was designed so that everybody from English students to engineering students and everything in between, including you know kinesiologists and psychologists and sociologists and everybody else on campus can uh, sit together and talk about games and other kinds of immersive interactive uh, media. And recently we've done a big push into the virtual reality, augmented reality space, so this is directly relevant to the work we do here. Um, if you are a prof and you are interested in being part of this, there's an elaborate um, application process which means you say, hey, I'm interested, and then we add you to the list. Um, and, and the other thing that's possible here is all the seating you see here is for students, graduate students and postdocs. And we currently have about 50 uh, uh, cubicles that are spoken for, but we can keep adding people and mixing and matching. And I'm saying this with uh, you know, our, our, our people sitting here who actually manage the space. I'm not mentioning you, Nicole, but that's be one of the people right there who have to figure out a place for people to sit. But you are welcome to sit here. We have a bunch of toys in a bunch of different rooms, including a, a VR storytelling lab that's, uh, that we're in the process of buying all the equipment for now. Um, so yes, we can be part of your research. Happy to do that. And as we connect with more and more of the centers, that will work as well. Um, okay, so lots going on in VR. The biggest point about here is that there are a number of researchers, many of whom are in games and VR, some just VR, many just game, but games are, we look at games and, and VR as being very, very tightly related. So that's why it's the Games Institute, not the VR Institute, although there's an argument that we should probably have two names. So we might look at that possibility as well. All right, we will be around, including Agata, can you raise your hand? Agata is my uh, uh, very much second in command here who runs the place and makes sure it operates when I'm not here and operates well when I am. That works out well. Uh, and Nicole will be here and Marisa will be here. And Marisa, thanks for wherever she is. Thanks for, oh, there you go. <laughs> People who sit in the front row scare me. So, um, <laughs> all right, so uh, thank you very much for setting this up and we'll be here and remember there's food and that all has to be finished or nobody leaves. Jen. Oh, my pleasure. Sounds like dinner time at my family's table, too. <laughs> so thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited, especially to connect some people I know already and we're already collaborating with on this very project, as a matter of fact. But uh, there's a lot more room for collaboration. So um, I'm going to present just one of the projects coming out of my research group today. Uh, I'm a assistant prof in systems design engineering. I also hold the Schlegel chair for technology for independent living. Um, so my research focuses on tech for aging. It is massively broad. I do everything from internet of things, ambient systems, embedded systems, lower tech stuff all over the map. One thing I'm interested in is the idea of games and how can we use games to not only support aging, but also to flip stigma. So it's kind of cool, you know, this project in particular, Extra Games for Dementia, where you're taking a population that's quite stigmatized and turning them into a bunch of gamers, which I think is super awesome because I am a gamer. Well, before I got a research career, I was, <laughs> I was a gamer, I'm not a gamer anymore. I'm, I'm a gamer and waiting till I have spare time again. So, you know, it's close to my heart, aging and gaming. So it's a really exciting and really awesome space for me because it brings two of my passions together. So for this project, we looked at the fact that exercise is awesome. It doesn't matter who you are, exercise is great. It's great for your mood, it's great for balancing your hormones. You actually, there's a social aspect to it. Usually, even if you're not doing it with someone, you usually have to go out and do it unless you have a home gym, um, and also, of course, the health benefits from the actual physical doing the exercise. Exercise for dementia also helps cognition. So it's been slow, shown to often slow or mitigate some of the symptoms that come with dementia. Can it reverse it? No, of course not. But it certainly doesn't do any harm, and if anything, it can potentially do a lot of good. So one of the problems, though, <coughs> for sorry, exercise with dementia, especially when you're getting towards more moderate and advanced stages and in long-term group 
settings is that they don't do it anymore. There's not enough exercise therapists to do one-on-one -on -one sessions with everybody all the time, so they get maybe one a week. And the group exercise settings are not accessible for people with that stage of dementia because it's just there's too much going on. They see their abilities are changing and so they often don't want to perform in group settings. And so they just stop altogether. And if you've ever been to long-term care, they do a lot of sitting. So arguably they're a population that could really benefit from moving around a bit more. So uh, this was actually the first stage was pilot work done by myself and my colleague in systems, Dr. Uh, Shi Chow, and we had one master's student who worked with us on this project. And what we wanted to do was, we're like, well, what can we use VR for? We're like, we want to try VR and dementia, but what are we even going to target? We ended up working with um, recreational therapists and exercise therapists uh, through Schlegel Villages, which is my research chair kind of gives me access to Schlegel. Um, and they were the ones who said, hey, how about exercise? And we thought, great, this is a nice fit between the modality, head-mounted VR with two hand controllers, and something that they see as a gap right now in supporting people with dementia living in institutional settings. So we ended up actually pairing up with uh, a exercise therapist from Schlegel came on as part of our team. So it was truly a co-designed piece of work that I'm about to show you, where she was the one who worked with her team, um, to, and we also consulted with the team at large, but they were the ones picking the movements. So they were the ones coming from best practice saying, hey, these are more the types of movements we want to see done with people with dementia. This is what we try to get them to do ourselves. These are the movements that are most beneficial for range of motion, for strength, and all the rest of that. Uh, but we also worked with people with dementia to co-develop these games that I'm going to show you. So we did a lot of consulting with them and a lot of iterative building out where we were trying to see, hey, how usable is the game interface that we're proposing, the types of activities and the actual uh, interactions themselves. So all these questions, you know, we obviously came up with at the start, but we didn't answer them ourselves. We got our collaborators to answer them for us. Kind of win-win in that respect. Um, right. And then we evaluated the technology with six people with dementia and a bunch of kinesiologists at Schlegel Villages as well. We got them to try it themselves to see what it is. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a sec. So the tasks and environment, um, and I'll show you all these exercises in a minute. So we ended up picking five exercises, and it was this balance between what exercises do they want to see, but also what is possible with a VR system. You know, so some things you just can't really emulate very well using VR. Um, but the other thing too was actually selecting an environment that would have meaning and uh, mesh with the age group and everything else and we came up with a farm and we back and forth a lot between different environments. Uh, a lot of the therapists wanted a pet store but they also were adamant that rowing was really important and we're like not clear how we're going to emulate rowing in a pet store. Like what can you do in a pet store where you're rowing? So we're like but on a farm you know we can put a rowboat in there and that makes sense, you know? So it was this trade-off between what they wanted to see and what was possible with the environment. Um, also farm, you know, gender neutral, it's calming. They were adamant too that, you know, it has to be something where people aren't gonna get too agitated because that's not gonna help them exercise. Though I don't know, exercising angry, <laughs> that can work out, but that's not the point of this research. Maybe next project. Um, but also people would be familiar with, and that's really important for dementia, so that it makes sense. You know, they're in a context where you ask them to do something, it intuitively makes sense, because they have uh, retrograde amnesia. So rehearsed memories are fairly strong, newer memories not so much. So, you know, again, we're trying to leverage their way of thinking and doing and being so that the environment maps onto their in ability to interact with an environment rather than what we think is cool to do. Though we thought this was cool as well. 
The other thing we built uh, was a calibration task. And what you see here, this is one of our uh, pre-participants. So she's actually just one of our um, debuggers, if you will. And it's kind of hard to see, but what she's doing is she's reaching for virtual apples in space. And so this is something else we came up with was how do we calibrate it? So calibration, of course, is very important in a 3D virtual environment. If, the, if you, things are out of reach, then the game is not fun at all <laughs> anymore. And with this population, you have obviously, you know, people who are different heights, what a five foot two lady can reach versus a six foot two guy. It's gonna be quite different, but also a lot of people have comorbidities like stroke, for example, where they can only move half their body and the other half not so well. So maybe their reach is like this far but they should still be able to play the game because that still is meaningful for them and it's still beneficial. But, you know, we don't want to go through this big calibration task. So we ended up just putting apples floating in space and getting them to reach as far as they comfortably could in different directions. And then that calibrated the system and it worked great. Um, then the actual activity. So they do that once at the very start and then that's it. They never had to do it again. It was sort of their profile. Um, and they, it kept that. And then it self-adapted and adjusted all the elements of the game so that they'd be within reach. So the tasks were head, neck, flexion, and extension. So this, you watched a butterfly going by and then that caused head rotation. Reaching straight ahead. So this is a sorting task where there's apples and oranges on the ground and you pick them up and put them into the correct bucket. Uh, and here we looked at things like, in terms of gameplay for dementia, it's really important that uh, error prevention is there. So for example, if you have an apple, you're trying to put it in the orange bucket, it just stays stuck to your hand. And when you put it in the apple bucket, it goes away. And there's sort of no judgment from the game there or anything. It just waits till you do the task correctly and it doesn't matter how long it takes. And there's no button presses is another thing, none. Literally, you just touch it with your hand and it kind of attaches and then you move it. Um, so that sort of thing, again, adapting the gameplay to suit people's abilities. Crossbody reaching is the same thing, only the apples and oranges flip sides. And it was actually, yeah, super effective, as you can see. Overhead reaching was a stacking task uh, with boxes onto a cart. And then rowing was a boat in a pond and arguably everybody's favorite task. And in fact, the master student, Mazar, who built this, she'd say like when she was having a bad developing day, she'd just turn on the rowboat for a while and just chill out. So um, do we have time for a short video? Sure. Um, so these are, these are actual participants using it. We don't have to watch the whole thing. Um, if it plays, yes. I don't know if you can hear the sand, probably not. But so here she's doing the calibration task. So you can see she's just reaching out and they just go a little further until you can't reach any further. And then that's, that's the movement for you. And as you can see here too, is like the incredible difference, the incredible variability in people's abilities. In terms of speed, in terms of reaching distance. And some people try to catch the butterfly. But it's doing what we're hoping it would do. And so we didn't give people instruction for this. They just sat down and used it. There's some verbal instruction from the um, actual game at the beginning of each task. It would give some verbal instruction, again, recorded by the exercise therapist using language and words that they felt were appropriate. Um, but we as researchers didn't prompt them as to what to do. So that gives you an idea. I know I'm running, uh, I think, a little over time, so I don't want to hog the whole stage. 
Um, so that's that's the quick overview of that. We trialed it with six people with dementia, and it worked great. They could all. It's actually this project is probably a highlight of my research career so far because it just it did what it was supposed to do so well, and people enjoyed it. You know, and I've done a lot of work with people with dementia, most of it around activities of daily living, toileting, dressing, etc. And this project, people get excited about more. And I think it's because it's enabling citizenship of a population that often we want to include, but we don't know how always. And this gives them a way, uh, something different and fun to kind of access that. So just quickly on top of this, um, and in terms of VR projects, branching out a little more, I'm also doing, looking at using VR for stroke, robotic stroke rehab with pusher syndrome. Um, and we're using VR for something else that is slipping my mind at the moment. And we're also looking at using social robotics and gameplay with kids and older adults. So I'm also very interested in games and intergenerational connectivity. And can we use, how can we use technology for meaningful relationships between younger, older generations? And games is obviously like a massive in for that. So um, I will end and thank you very much. Oh, and we have a demo, I think, if later on, if you guys want to see, talk to Karen and Yuru. Um, they will demo our VR system for anyone who is interested later on. Thank you. Hi, sorry about that. Um, my name is uh, Gata Jane. Um, I'm with the Games Institute. <laughs> and um, I'm going to talk to you today about VR content specifically, but um, kind of the VR AR industry. And specifically, my background is in English. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to introduce myself because I'm talking. I'm not really a researcher. So the, the story of how I got here explains why I'm going to talk in broad terms about quite a few different things. And then I'm going to talk about the project that we're setting up at the Games Institute, which is called Cavern Studio, which is my main project. So essentially, um, the overview is I'm a filmmaker, and um, my background is in English literature. and I came and started working with the Games Institute to set up research partnerships in VR and AR. So as part of um, uh, the, the Shirk partnership grant that we're developing. And so what I did was go around, travel around, um, meet people, contact anybody I could in the VR, AR, anything in immersive reality industry. Um, and start thinking about how can we build partnerships, what are the questions and problems that are happening in the industry that might overlap with research, um, and, so, and just started building relationships. But my background is in film. Um, I also have a production company where we're, at, where we're currently producing a web series that will be shot in Waterloo this year. Um, and so those two things mean that I both kind of have a, this overarching view of the VR AR industry with a focus on the content industries. And so my interest is how do you tell stories in virtual reality? Um, what are the grammars, like what, what, what is the grammar of VR storytelling? Um, how are you, like, how does acting change from theater to film to virtual reality? Questions like that. That's my personal interest and that's the kind of the projects that I personally work on. But I'm also doing a lot of work developing relationships for other researchers. So this is something that if you're interested in working in VR or you're already working in VR, AR, I might know people that are um, possibly relevant um, uh, industry contacts because I just talk to a lot of people in the industry. So. Um, if we go, what I want to do is sort of give an overview of some of my understanding of what's happening in the industry and then talk a little bit more in depth about the content industry and about what we're working on. Um, so the VR industry, um, it, it's really, the way that I look at the VR industry is the, and AR is basically that it's the mapping of the digital space into 360, right? So people talk about it as a technology that's emerging, or they'll talk about um, in the content industry, they'll ask questions like, what kinds of stories will we tell, or is it a narrative form? And really, basically, if you take anything, the way that I see it is if you take anything that you currently do on a screen, and mix that with everything that you currently do in the world, eventually there'll be some intersection, which is basically everything. Um, so it's going to kind of emerge in these different fields, and different fields have different um, 
different, they're at different places in their development. My focus is very much on uh, the storytelling genres and where we are uh, with that is people, there's a lot of uh, places where people are creating things, but it's seen very much as, as this experiential form. It's something where people are trying, they're creating stories, they're experimenting with how do you tell stories and who's going to watch them and what the market is. And there's these just these different open questions. One of them is, um, what are the market? What? How will people watch it? Will they be watching it at home? Will they be watching in our arcades? There's these, you know, if you're familiar with how people are consuming it now, there are these kind of attempts to figure out maybe people will game in arcades, go to cinemas, and then have at-home viewing. Um, but these things are sort of attempts. So the market is kind of stuck with, we need a market, we need to know, uh, we need the technology to be good enough, and we need the storytelling to be good enough uh, to, so that people will actually adopt it and use it. And these all have kind of open uh, questions that industry is figuring out, but they also have open research questions. Um, there are questions that, like, w how do you direct attention in VR? What does that do to a person? How does that integrate with um, the person's physical experience, with the person's understanding of the story? All of these things kind of link between actual things people are trying to figure out as they build things and research questions. Um, so we are, uh, these are specific areas that I'm working on setting up projects in. Uh, so the grammar of 360 storytelling is really, if you, if you know anything about film, um, we have, uh, basically you have a shot and it's on a screen, so you have a shot and you organize your shots with an edit. In virtual reality, you have edits, but you're or organizing around a person in the space. So you have um, different problems. In film, film is really good at directing attention. It's really good at telling you where to look, but it's really bad at creating this, like inherently really bad at creating a sense of continuous space and continuous time. So a lot of the, the kind of key editing mechanisms that were developed were around, um, it's called, uh, continuity editing, and the principles are you basically show people, if you know a basic film, stru film structure, you show people the big space and then you show them what's in the space and you understand, okay, I've seen the whole space and now I can see that there's individuals in the space and you can kind of take me through the scene. So that's designed to compensate for not being inherently good at continuous space. Um, but virtual reality, you actually invert that problem. It doesn't naturally direct your attention, but it does naturally give you a sense of continuous space. So you basically are layering in in new storytelling methods and new ways of understanding how you're directing with something where a lot of people are coming from film so they have an opposite expectation. So um, I've started working with um, filmmakers who are moving into virtual reality as well as theater people who are, who are interested in moving into virtual reality. And what we're looking to do is set up collaborations where we bring researchers in to engage and collaborate and um, both think about what research problems there are, but also kind of think about, okay, well, how do we lay down a grammar? How, what can we say? What can we theorize and explain? What tools can we kind of work back and forth and use the multiple different tool sets to develop ideas and kind of develop a foundation for the discipline? Um, so what we're building is, uh, we're calling it the Cavern Studio, and it basically is a studio project to bring together um, researchers, and industry and creatives in various configurations. So my role in this is a lot to uh, find people and assemble projects and find people that are working in areas where they can support or help each other and then figure out, okay, here there's a company that's doing this. This is that they have an interesting either resource or uh, problem set and there's a researcher that's interested in this so we can assemble and figure out how are we going to make this happen? How can we bring the resource seekers together to make projects that aren't necessarily uh, strictly research and they're not strictly development but they're kind of overlaps between people's areas of interest. Um, so we've, uh, I think the next slide, oh this is, yes, so this is some of the things we are hoping to do, which is bring people together and also because we've done all this work building this international network, one of the goals is to bring that network and center it in at the University of Waterloo, make um, the research here connected to the global uh, VR, AR 
network. So if you're working in VR AR, please talk to me because I just talk to everybody and I can and I really like to say, oh, okay, I can make this connection for you or I can make this uh, introduction or here's an actual intersection. And also that's a, that's a big part of how you can get involved with. So I'm working with the setting up the Caverns project. Um, so Neil had mentioned that if you're working in VR and AR, especially to do with narrative, talk to him about um, that grant because that's a place where we're doing a lot of networking um, and building this research network. So it's a good thing to be part of. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, so for the cavern studio, which is specifically, this is the area, the, um, the work that I've been doing making in the networks, that's across the VR, AR industry. So I'll talk to anybody I talk to, anybody who basically has anything to do with VR, AR. I have a conversation, find out what they're doing. Um, the Cavern Studio focuses specifically on content. So storytelling projects is really the theme of it. And so we've identified four research areas um, that are open problems in the content industry. And a lot of these are problems that exist in the content industry and are kind of pervasive problems before uh, VR, AR. Like, for example, we'll start with economics of content. That's a, that's a problem that is not really started by VR and AR. Yes, there are market problems that are specifically related to the fact that it's an emerging market, but there are also problems because as you move into uh, digital spaces, we have uh, fewer and fewer people paying for content. It's harder to um, fight piracy. And these things mean that what's happening is the economic model around content shifts more and more towards people, um, advertisers uh, paying for advertisers, product placement, and basically, if individuals don't pay for their own content, then you have um, companies paying for the content, which shapes what gets what gets made and who gets to see it. And um, a really good, so we, like you probably heard people talk about the golden age of television right now and how suddenly the television uh, is shifting to these much stronger, more interesting stories and movies are shifting in the other direction. Um, what people often don't mention about that is that uh, what happened when that the sudden change in the form happened is you started getting um, television channels like HBO and Showcase, basically subscriber-based channels, right? So it's actually the subscriber-based economic model that shifts what content you get. So you can see very clearly that when you when you had um, in the network shows, those shows were much more um, shaped by advertiser content. Whereas the shows that you're getting like Breaking Bad or um, The Sopranos, those shows are shaped by what viewers are wanting and choosing. Now, this means that economics of content like is very, uh, significant to what we see. Um, it's significant even if you go into like social media world. So as we build into three, 360 space, this becomes um, an opportunity potentially to shift things that are underlying the interfaces. Um, so the economics of content might include thinking about, okay, well, how do you build interfaces that allow for um, economic models that favor certain kinds of content or favor certain kinds of uh, uh, social interactions or certain things, right? Um, so meaningful metrics is, if you think about online, um, counting basically what you can count easily online. So there's a lot in the content industry of focusing on what's getting likes, views, subscribers, um, shares, because those are the things, and obviously also what gets paid for. Um, these are the things that are easy to count. But the problem with these metrics is that they don't necessarily align with how people report feeling about the things. What you like doesn't necessarily, what you click like on doesn't necessarily um, line up with what you necessarily deeply like or deeply care about. So this set of questions is looking at um, how do we collect information, how do we interpret that information, how do we understand and measure what makes meaningful experiences, and how do we use that to shape choices we make about content, choices we make about uh, what content we um, privilege, so it might relate to algorithm structures, um, and it might relate to uh, collecting biosensory data and interpreting that. So there's a number of possible uh, research subjects under that. Pathways to audience is basically a distribution problem. It's, it's who's, who's seeing it, how, 
who's seeing what content? How do you decide how to get it to the audience? Um, this is a very complicated area right now because you have uh, so many people watching content um, and such a noisy, oversaturated market. Uh, and the ways that you access them have radically changed with social media, advertising has changed. Um, so the content industry is extremely disrupted in its distribution and marketing models. And there's a lot of uh, trying to understand how to integrate, how to, how to access people through social media, and also what kinds of content people will follow what paths to. Um, so this is basically distribution and, and getting and figuring out the relationship between content and the audience. Um, and then the third area is basically everything that has to do with what goes into the content and how people experience it, which is probably the huge, it's like a very large um, section. So that might be, that's where the grammar of 360 narrative would come in. That's where if you're framing, for example, an experience, let's say you're, you, uh, a project was about how do we frame storytelling so that people know what to expect. So when you go to a film and you know you're going to a drama film in a certain context, you have certain cues when you go into a theater um, you, you're familiar with that form. That form is based on the form of a theater, a, uh, like a stage theater that people knew about for a long time. So we have a bunch of kind of contextual cues that you're going to have this kind of experience. Now, when you put on a VR headset and you try to have a, uh, a story experience, those are a completely different set of contextual cues. So how does that affect um, your experience of the piece? How do we uh, how do you um, set up the experiences so you lead people to the experience that you want? Or, um, yeah, lots of questions like that. Uh, so essentially, those are the four. And, and then experience design can also be uh, related to like physical experiences. Um, it really can uh, incorporate anything that's within the experience. So what we're essentially doing with these is I'm working to set up uh, partnership-based projects where we just collaborate. So researchers collaborate with creatives or people from industry. And in if these are area, these are the areas. I specifically work in the storytelling one of this. But what I'm also trying to do is find people that are interested in working on these problems, interested in thinking about how would we set up interesting uh, approaches to kind of bringing together building something with research and to start answering and solving some of these problems. Yes, that's my email. Thanks very much for having me. Um, my name is Michael Barnett Cowan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology here at Waterloo. Since we're sharing our background stories and interests of games, um, I can tell you that I got fascinated by video games probably around the age of seven when I saw my friend's older brother bring a Nintendo home. Uh, and I've never gone back since. So yes, there are ways to continue to play video games, especially post tenure. Um, so, um, and actually as a child, I, I was fascinated also by uh, the development of video game content and, and this new sort of idea, or new to me, this idea of virtual reality. So this concept of being able to immerse oneself in some sort of an alternative um, universe and have a sense of agency and control over that was very fascinating to me. Um, and uh, I guess through high school, I got bored with all the stuff they were teaching me, so I decided to learn about new stuff and try to tackle a hard question about how does the human brain work. Um, and that led me to a um, background in experimental psychology um, from the arts perspective initially and then more and more into the harder sciences. Um, and really importantly, um, I, was, I, I know this now in retrospect, I was very, very privileged in some of the places I ended up. So as a graduate student, I was at um, York University Center for Vision Research, which is a, a world-class uh, vision research center, which is very truly multidisciplinary. You know, they, you know, you're sitting next to engineers and computer scientists and psychologists and kinesiologists in the same place with the same labs with shared spaces. Um, I was exposed to a tremendous amount of um, multidisciplinary uh, research there. Uh, from there, I went on to do a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, um, which is uh, probably one of the strongest centers for virtual reality research uh, in the world. Um, I was involved in a very large um, European grant that was looking at how you could use motion simulators to solve the problem of how do you train pilots 
to recover an aircraft when it starts to fall from the sky. And the current ways of doing so is you take an airplane up into the sky and you make it drop. And someone who's experienced at recovering that airplane teaches you how to do that. And a lot of the way that they do it is they have to teach you how to feel the way that the orientation of you spinning around as you plummet down to the earth might give you some sense of direction so that you can recover this, uh, this aircraft. And um, um, a lot of interest in Europe was, uh, can we find a cheaper, less uh, you know, <laughs> risky way of doing this? And so um, I worked a lot with these really fascinating um, simulators that, uh, to the best of their abilities, would mimic the conditions of being in these chaotic sort of um, flight situations. Um, I then went on to do a, another postdoc at Western University to look at um, neuroprocessing using fMRI to understand how the brain processes information about gravity, and then very quickly I got scooped up here and I'm now in a kinesiology department. Um, and just before I got here, the Oculus Rift system came up. And I bought the first system and I started playing with it. And there was a lot of hype at the time about it. Um, but to be honest, I put the first system on. I was like, yeah, that's OK. It's not that great. Right? And actually, that was a, a testament to the um, sort of the development of virtual reality technology for the last sort of 40 years or so, um, where you have this concept of, OK, I'm going to put a screen on somebody's face. I'm going to have some content. The user moves. There's a little bit of updating that goes on in the world. Um, and that's supposed to make you feel that you're somewhere else. The problem is, you're still here. You have a body in the real world, and your central nervous system is telling you, ah, I have a body in the real world. And even though part of me feels like I'm not here anymore, unless that content's really compelling, you, you can't trick yourself into thinking about that. Um, go back to just a few years ago in the current generation of uh, VR technology, and we're getting way closer. So there are two main reasons. One is the resolution's gotten much better. Actually, I should say three, more, three or more main reasons. Te technology has gotten better in terms of the visual resolution. Um, the other one is that the latency from when you start to move to when there's visual updating on the screen has been dr reduced dramatically. So now it's in the order of about 20 milliseconds, which is quick. If you think about 20 milliseconds, it's gone before you can even say a word. But in brain time, 20 milliseconds is still fairly significant. Um, but what it's meant is that now when you go into VR, you actually really kind of feel like you're there. Um, and then the other thing that's happened is that the, the content has become much more evocative. So this is a, an image of my daughter two years ago, Quinn. Uh, she was eight years at the time. This was the first time she was trying virtual reality. Um, and she was playing a game that looked something like this. Um, it's called First Contact. And you're in this little environment. There's this robot, and there's things on the shelf, and you can pick them up. That's a soda can that's shown in that photograph. This was her picking up the soda can and trying to drink from it. And the really compelling thing about this is that we now finally have technology that is actually driving behavior, right? It's very similar to what Jen was showing, right, with the, with the Alzheimer's patients. Um, and this, this is like the moment where a lot of researchers for a very long time have been hoping to have the access to this kind of technology. So um, we're doing a lot. I, I made the poor choice of not just picking one study, but a few. Um, but I'm not going to go into all the details about them. I just want to give you a sampling of the, some of the things that we're doing um, both in my research lab, but also a lot of these have been uh, collaborative projects with the Games Institute. Um, and r really, if you're going to do experiments that are going to mimic reality as much as humanly possible, you need a big team of people to pull that off. It's not, it's not easy to do. So um, I'll try to give you a sampling of that by going through these. Um, just a bit of other background non-related to VR. She's able to skip the slides. Um, I just want to say, I, I do other stuff too that I don't have time to talk about. We do a lot of stuff about um, uh, multisensory integration and aging. So how does the central nervous system change as we age? And then how does it process sensory information and put it together differently from when we're younger? And what are the consequences of that? Um, I also uh, have a very large motion platform, um, which is located in the CC Care facility in the North Campus. Uh, so this is a six degree of motion, uh, motion simulator. Uh, we've got integrated eye and head tracking systems. We've got an Oculus that's now integrated with this system as well. And one of the reasons why we have this system is that um, we want to look at how does the brain process information when you're in motion. Right. A lot of what we know about uh, processing sensory information, the decisions that we make, comes from experiments where you're seated on a chair with a chin on a chin rest, and you present things on a screen, and you push buttons. That's not how we live, right? We move. Now, this is still not getting quite there, because you're now strapped to a chair, and I can move you and wiggle you around a little bit. But 
at least we can extend our current models in terms of understanding how the brain works by doing that. And so we're using a lot of virtual reality te technology to figure this out. Um, we're also trying to figure out um, what happens during curious events that we know are life-threatening and, and pose a risk to people in our society. So falls are a really interesting case that we're, we're working on. Um, if you've ever fallen before, your recollection of that fall might be very distorted from your normal experience about what happens around you. It's often, I'm walking, everything was fine, and then you're down on your ass on the ground and you don't know how you got there. And Time might have slowed down during it. You might not have noticed things during it. Why is that? What changes? What, what happens to the suppression of consciousness during a fall? And also, um, what sorts of information are you taking in? And so we can do things like we can, in a kinesiology department, we can drop people safely with a, with a harness, right? And we can drop people repeatedly over and over and over again and ask them questions like, what did you see? What did you notice? When did you begin to feel like you were falling? And while we're doing that, we can put people into virtual environments, like what happens when you're at the top of a virtual skyscraper? How do you fall differently? What do you think about? These are now the sorts of questions we can do because we've got very evocative content um, that's available uh, using virtual reality. Um, we're also looking at, uh, this is really new, there's a lot of people who are interested in trying to figure out, okay, so how can we understand uh, changes in cortical activity using EEG, so measuring for off the scalp um, patterns of brain activity, uh, as people are uh, immersed in virtual environments. Now, technologically it's tricky because you've got a lot of interference between the headset, both physically in terms of putting pressure over the, the electrodes that you're putting over the scalp, um, and also some of the interference from the movement that you're, uh, that you're producing when you're moving around. Uh, but we've had some success in uh, being able to show some early signs that you can um, get cortical activity that is very similar to an actual fall. Um, so if you measure somebody falling in the real world, you'll get cortical responses that seem to be related to the, um, that fall itself. And we are able to show that we can find similar sorts of activity if I just visually move you as if you fell. So if I take the camera and I move you as if you were falling in the real world, we'll get similar sorts of responses from the brain. And we're now trying to figure out how this might be related to falls research. Um, but a big thing that we've been looking at in uh, my lab has been trying to figure out why do people get sick in virtual reality? And why do some people get more sick than others? And this is one of the biggest impediments of this technology. We all know that this technology is great. If you don't know, you're finding out today. Um, but a lot of people will report sickness, whether it's a headache, whether they literally need to throw up in that moment. And it means that even if you've got a really cool game that you want to play and you're immersed in it, or maybe you're an older adult and you want to play this game you know, for rehabilitation purposes, after about 20 minutes, most people don't want to play it anymore. Right? And why is that? What's going on? Well, one of the main things that we think is going on is that, again, the central nervous system is challenged with this is me, this is my body, right? I'm getting information about my body in a real physical environment and I'm being tricked into thinking that I'm somewhere else. And that creates a conflict. And when the central nervous system has conflicts in terms of thinking about where it truly is versus where it might be, uh, some of the natural reactions to this is a sickness. One theory is that, um, you have to remember like we all evolved, right? And we didn't evolve in environments with virtual reality. If you're working, uh, wandering around in the environment and suddenly the world's kind of shaking and moving around unbeknownst to you and not under your control, you might have been poisoned, right? You might have had a berry that poisoned you and can lead to these sort of, sort of neurological conditions. And so we know that there's these associations with cue conflict and sickness that need to be um, resolved. So um, one of the other things that's interesting with virtual reality gets back to this idea that you know the content is very evocative. Um, the, th this is a bit old now. This, this was a, a comic that originally came out saying, you know, this is the reality of virtual reality. But actually, the, the technology is coming here. We have a lot of tetherless technology currently. But most of the technology that is out there in people's living rooms is still like this. And this poses other conflicts, right? There's lots of other cues that will constrain your behavior. While at the same time, the content's getting strong enough that you start to forget about this, right? You start to forget that you're in a small, confined space. And you're in a virtual environment. And I want to run off to the mountains and keep on going, right? So again, there are some problems with this and we're trying to get around these uh, issues. But I think the more important thing is that people are really changing their behavior in response to the content. But at the same time, it's also posing problems too. 
Um, so again, getting back to those conflicts, if there are delays within the system, if you are not controlling your own body appropriately um, in terms of like balance control, for example, there's also some risks that are associated with putting people in these virtual environments. So in fact, um, there's been links in the literature between um, individual differences between how people are able to control their balance and their likelihood of getting sick. And the thought has been that, um, yeah, getting sick, you can go to the next one. Um, the thought has been that, you can go to the next one too. Um, the thought has been that um, balance control is a really hard problem. So you have to control your center of mass over your base of support in a dynamic way. Your body is constantly in motion when you're standing up and there's multiple cues to your central nervous system telling you about where your center of mass is. You've got visual cues, you've got somatosensory cues through your feet and in real time the brain has to solve this problem so that you don't fall down. Um, and so there's been some reports suggesting that those that have bigger problems with balance control might be more sick. And they may be more sick in virtual reality um, because they also are having problems integrating this information and putting it together. Then some other literature says, no, it's the other way around. People who are better at balancing uh, are more likely to get more sick. And so we tried to um, answer some of these questions using a very large study in partnership with some of the people here from the Games Institute in a public uh, data collection at the Ontario Science Centre um, where we had uh, the ability to test a large sample of people and have them go through a number of different tasks to try to look at this association. So we had people play two different games they played uh, First Contact, which is rated as being a comfortable, non-nauseating experience by most users. And then a game called Adrift, which is a space simulation game. And you're on this um, uh, spacecraft and you have to escape. And it's very, very nauseating. People get sick within a few minutes playing this game. And this enabled us to compare and contrast people's responses to these two different games while also collecting information about their likelihood of getting sick on planes, trains, and automobiles, but also sickness ratings uh, after they actually did the, the task itself. Um, we also measured things like balance control when they had their eyes open, or when we challenged the balance control system by putting the feet closer together, uh, or we challenged it even further by having you stand on, on foam, which reduces somatosensory cues about telling you where your, your feet are, and then taking vision away, which also can challenge uh, your balance control. Um, so I'm, I, again, I can't talk about all those things. If you're interested in any of these, by the way, I'm t giving a talk in optometry at 4.30, little plug, um, where I'll actually go through the results. This is just a, a survey of what we do. Um, another thing we're doing is we're looking at whether individual differences in people's sensitivity to self-motion from the vestibular system, so this is a system inside your inner ear, which tells you information about how your head is moving with relationship to gravity, whether individual differences in your threshold for self-motion might relate to sickness. So for example, this is data we've collected on our motion platform where people are having to uh, discriminate whether they're moving from the left or to the right, and we can measure their threshold for being able to detect that difference. And you can see that there's a distribution. Some people are very, very sensitive to self-motion. Some people are a little bit less sensitive to self-motion. And on average, it's about 0.8 degrees per second that you can discriminate the difference between left and right motion. So what we've been doing is we've been, um, in addition to doing sort of our hardcore sort of research lab uh, based experiments, we've also been working with the Games Institute to teach people uh, how to build content in virtual reality. So the way that we've been approaching this is I taught a class um, for kinesiology. It was based on the principles of multisensory integration and how could you design a research experiment using virtual and augmented reality technology to solve this problem. And we paired up with developers who taught the students how game engines work and the basic principles of coding these things. Now, we didn't have any expectations that they would learn how to code, but they worked with the students, and I asked the students, okay, just dream up an experiment. What do you want to do? Tell the developers, and we'll work in the background, and we'll rapidly prototype something that you want to have done. And by doing so, we could do things like, the, there was one student, for example, who wanted to use um, some sort of biofeedback in terms of your orientation in the world as you navigated it. So if you had problems with your balance control, maybe you could walk around in a virtual environment. We could manipulate the influence of tilting the room and stuff like that in terms of your balance control. And then we could have a frame of reference. We'd get information from the accelerometers in the, in the virtual reality system, and it would give you feedback on where you are. That was done in a term. Right, by a student who had a really cool idea, and working with the developers, we could do that really quickly for them. 
I think I'm going to pause there because I don't, I don't want to go too much into more time. This is another experiment where we had Korean students come to the Games Institute. We taught them an experiment about how they could change their representation of their body. We were working with philosophers here on this project, which was really interesting. Um, I, I, I could go on. There's lots of really cool stuff that we're doing. Um, but what you really, I, I guess what I was asked to do was to talk about what we're doing. So I've done that. What are the roadblocks? One of the biggest roadblocks we have is the content generation. So it, it can be very challenging to create these really evocative sorts of stimuli. And one of the ways we've gotten around it is we are doing some bottom-up programming. So we have an idea as experimentalists. We want to create this virtual environment that does X, Y, and Z. So we do that from the ground up using a, a game engine. Um, but we're also using off-the-shelf, commercially available games. And so one of the first things we did when we got uh, three Oculus systems in the lab was I told the whole lab, go play games for a couple days. Drop everything, just play games. Play every single game you can get your hands on in the library, and then we'll have some lab meetings, we'll figure out what's out there, and can we get segments of the games and create experiments from them? And that's what I was doing with the cyber sickness stuff. Uh, but it still continues to be a bit of a challenge. Um, so necessarily working with a large, huge network of different people from different backgrounds has been really important. Um, we've recently been looking at things like the influence of narrative on gaming experiences. Most lab-based VR research is dull and boring and you know, reach for this and point to that or whatever. Wouldn't it be more immersive if there's a whole story around it? And we've been showing that actually if you enrich the narrative, it can actually reduce symptoms of sickness. Um, particularly in people who don't have an experience with gaming. So um, I guess that's where I want to end things. I'm very open to questions and people who want to collaborate. Um, we're getting a lot of interest from industry who want to sort of use these sorts of techniques and try to improve you know, daily living for some people or people in the workforce, for example. Uh, so if anybody has any creative ideas, I'm more than welcome to uh, entertain those. Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. All right, so that's our presentations for the day. We saw VR work in health, in kinesiology, and in industry games and creativity. Um, please take this time to network. We have uh, until 1.30. There's rooms that have demos from both uh, Jen's lab and the Games Institute's Immersion Lab. Uh, so please feel free to use those. Um, feedback. This is the first of hopefully a monthly uh, networking series. We want to be able to network researchers together, postdocs, to actually have relevant grant-like benefits, industry partnerships, major grants. So if you have any suggestions for future events or suggestions on how to improve events like this, please let me know. And then also keep us up to date. We can do this every month, but we need to know that it's actually helping. So metrics are important. So if you do tend to collaborate and network and see benefit from this, connect with people you don't normally connect with, or start developing teams, please get in touch with our centers. Keep us in the loop. Help us to know what it, that we're doing something useful so that we can continue to do this throughout other themes and support other faculty and researchers. All right, uh, thank you very much for being here. And uh, yeah, enjoy the day. Thank you.